Between October 1428 and May 1429, during the Hundred Years' War, the city of Orléans in France was besieged by English forces. On May 8, 1429, Joan of Arc, a teenage French peasant girl, successfully led a military force to break the siege of the city and liberate France from the English invader. Hundred Years' War The Siege of Orléans occurred during the Hundred Years' War, an inheritance dispute between the ruling houses of France and England for supremacy over France. The conflict had begun in 1337, when King Edward III of England decided to press his claim to the French throne, a claim based on his being the son of Elizabeth of France. England's King Edward III looked jealously across the English Channel. Wanting France for his own, he had added the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, to his own royal standard. The Siege of the City Since October 1428, Orléans was besieged by the English, who surrounded it, controlling the nearby towns. Orléans was a very important strategic point to gain control of the Loire lands together with Angers, Tours, or Blois. The Earl of Salisbury arrived in France in June with 6,000 men. To these were added another 4,000 more from the Duke of Bedford, who took them out of the garrison established in Normandy. South of Orléans flows the Loire River, and to the other bank there was a small island Ile Saint-Antoine in the middle. The south side of the French city bordered the river for about 1,200 feet, so it had a bridge to there, 19 stone arches, ending in a small defensive structure. While on the other side of the bank, to the north of it, there was a barbican called a boulevard, which made access to the fortification difficult, where there was a passageway that led to a drawbridge defended by two towers. Reaching this point, you could access the island of St. Antone following the bridge and then the city. This was the point that the English attacked for two days. They began a bombardment of the Tourelles and the fort. On October 23, 1428, the French abandoned these positions. A day later, Salisbury climbed one of the two towers and from the heights tried to keep an eye on the French movements. But unfortunately for him, a French Bolano passed through the window through which he was looking, receiving a fatal impact on the face, dying a week later. His successor was the Earl of Suffolk. This, together with Bedford, dedicated himself to reinforcing the area and guarding the position. The latter brought two prestigious generals, Lord Talbot and Lord Scales, who arrived on December 1st and replaced Suffolk. Lord Talbot focused on the west side of Orleans, on the same shore as the city, where they controlled five points on the map, which he connected to each other. The most important of these, the Church of St. Laurent, formed a kind of bastion, which they greatly reinforced, becoming their headquarters for maneuvers in the area. He also took over the island of Charlemagne, which was in the middle of the Loire and also to the west of the city, and on the other shore he took the church of saint Privé. Guillermo Glasdale now took charge of the Tourelle area, cordoning off the city of Orléans, which found itself cornered closer and closer to the final attack. The northeast area of the city was not spared either, as Suffolk built another fortress there, around the church of saint Lou, and one around saint Leblanc. During the winter, they dedicated themselves to continue reinforcing their positions while receiving a troop reinforcement of 1,500 soldiers from the Burgundians. Meanwhile, they tried to occupy a vast forest that protected the city naturally to the northeast of it, which they could not take. The Arrival of the Resistance As for the defense, despite the seniority of the soldiers, there were only approximately 500 troops and so they decided to fortify the city as much as possible. In this way, the neighbors and inhabitants of the city, merchants, bakers, innkeepers, and peasants, organized themselves into 34 companies to defend the city's 34 defense towers. Shortly after Salisbury's death, Le Batard d'Orléans arrived, that is, John of Orléans, the Bastard of Orléans, accompanied by 600 men as a troop. Thus, he would be entrusted with the defense of the city. Up to approximately 6,000 men gradually followed this night to help defend the city, thus holding out until February 12, 1429, when Charles VII sent reinforcements to intercept an English supply between Rouvray and Jeanville coming from Paris. The failure was absolute due to negligence, and over 700 men were lost in what is known as the Battle of the Herrings. In this way, the provisions of the French city began to run out, 
and a good part of the nobility decided to abandon it in view of the future disaster. Everything seemed favorable for the English and the Burgundians, but an argument at the end of February between the Duke of Burgundy and the Duke of Bedford created a rivalry between the two and the Burgundians abandoned their siege positions for the following month. Joan takes action. But there was another determining event, and it is the appearance on the scene of a young girl who claimed to be sent by God, and who put as proof the fact that she would be the one who would free Orléans from the siege. As Charles hesitated, a young peasant girl arrived at his court. She claimed to have received saintly visions, giving her a divine task to help Charles become king and drive the English out of France forever and he charged the 17-year-old with the near-impossible mission to liberate Orléans. It was Jeanne, who had just received the blessing in Poitiers from the hand of the king. She came armed with a sword that she brought from St. Catherine de Fierbois, the sanctuary of the knights, and with a banner, she was also endowed with armor that she herself requested and chose. The king had decided to provide Joan with some 10 or 12,000 men, as she indicated at the Rouen trial, and commented that she decided to enter through the fortress of saint Lou and then on Les Tourelles. Joan of Arc already began by notifying the English of his arrival with a letter and asking them to withdraw, whose response to which was nothing more than insults. Before her arrival in Orléans, Joan of Arc had to overcome a difficult journey. She was first sent with reinforcement troops to Blois, one of the towns on the Loire near Orléans, just outside the circle that the English troops formed around Orléans. The next city on the map was Beaugency, and then came Meung and Orléans. From that city, she inspired the troops and the people of the cities. She proved to have a great ability to see the positions on plan and thus be able to draw up a good strategy. She also had the support of the generals who accompanied her. Juana's companions to Blois, according to the bastard, were quite prominent people. The journey from Blois to saint Lou, as she said, could not be done otherwise than by taking an immense loop, following the Sologne route, through the cities south of the Loire, until reaching the northeast of Orléans. She came from the west, always following the Loire River. On April 28th, Joan of Arc arrived at Chessy, where she would spend that night, and the bastard was finally able to meet her in person. Given the adverse circumstances, in addition to the strength of the English, of the headwind coming from the east, the bastard moved the positions back a little to protect his troops and the recently arrived reinforcements with Joan of Arc. The liberation of the city of Orléans. He was surprised because he saw that what she intended was not what she had found. She would have gone straight to the Tourelles to attack Lord Talbot with the reserve troops. At that very moment, the wind began to change direction, favoring the bastard, who probably began to believe that it was a miracle. It seemed so because then the bastard ordered to enter St. Lou, with hopes now more than ever placed on Joan of Arc. Thus, winning, they were able to enter Orléans through the Burgundy Gate on the afternoon of April 29th, being received with great joy by the inhabitants of the city. Juana would stay in one of the best houses in the town, and she spent the first days living with the people of Orléans. On May 1st, the bastard left Orléans in search of the royal army, which was at Blois, with which he contacted on the 4th. With them, they would attack the small fortress of saint pouet which led to Paris, with which the English had to put the small garrison that remained defending saint Lou to defend it, losing both. The English saw themselves lost and decided to evacuate their small fortresses to concentrate all their resources on the south bank of the Loire, that is, in Les Tourelles and Saint-Jean-le-Blanc. Juana took the initiative on the 6th, after having sent some three letters to the English the day before. Leaving the Burgundy Gate, she crossed the Loire passing the small islands, Ile de Martinet, in between and settling on the largest. From there, she would launch an attack on the fortification of Saint-Jean-le-Blanc. Seeing them coming, the English fled to the convent of Les Augustins, just below the Tourelle, where they concentrated and awaited the French attack launched from Leblanc. While all this was happening, La Hire and Joan launched the attack to the west, where the English were sheltering, Les Augustins. There, the English had approximately 500 soldiers who were able to withstand this first attack essentially by means of archers and cannons. During the afternoon of that day, the French attacked variously trying to set fire to the wooden structures that were there. Then the English started a counterattack near nightfall, but La Hire, one of Joan's generals, responded with an attack with armed men on horseback. 
that drove them back to their fortifications. Finally, the troops that had been crossing the Loire joined and took control of the fortified convent of Les Augustins. At the same time, Talbot was puzzled that he could not send help to cover the bastards' attacks on the northwestern fortifications. The one he was most interested in keeping was Saint Laurent, the biggest, but he didn't get away with it. On the night of the 6th to the 7th, Talbot tried to rearrange positions for a greater and more effective defense. Since he had lost the places closest to the Tourelle, he took out the troops that he had in saint Privé and on the island of Charlemagne, and transferred them mainly to the Tourelles and the attached Barbican. Meanwhile, Joan spent the same night in Orléans. The seventh day was the key day. Early in the morning, Joan crossed the river to meet with the other chiefs who were to the east of the Tourelles and the adjoining Barbican. The bastard explained that Joan curiously asked him to wait a little longer, so she took the horse and went alone to a vineyard to pray for victory for half an hour. When she returned, with courage and the banner, she attacked. Joan accompanied those who went up the stairs and tried to climb them. But an English arrow took her away from the fight, seriously wounding her. It landed just below her shoulder and her cleavage, which discouraged the French. The bastard decided to withdraw from the battle for the day and reorganize the strategy. Joan tried to persuade him to continue, even if it was with her absence while she withdrew to pray in private. It is said that a soldier named Le Basque took her banner, and with it went to attack the enclosed field followed by the French army. Thus, seeing the banner, the militia took courage enough to penetrate that same day, while on the other hand, the French sent a burning barge to the bridge that separated the Barbican from the Tourelle. This weakened the bridge and collapsed the English leader, who in a desperate attempt tried to make the troops cross the bridge, placing himself in the small defensive structure in the middle. Skillfully, the townspeople rushed in and broke enough sections of the bridge to prevent the English troops from achieving their objectives. The battle was now over. Finally, on May 8th, the English began a withdrawal, but not before trying one last attack by means of their archers or longbowmen, a specialty of archers typical of the English characterized by the long distance they could achieve by shooting the arrow, effective as piercing enemy armor. In any case, they did not achieve their objective and had to withdraw from their small fortifications northwest of Orléans, heading towards Myung which was the closest city to them in that direction. Just after the flight of the English troops, Joan organized a mass and prayers for those killed in the battle. From this moment on, everyone saw how the miracle announced by Joan of Arc had come true. In fact, she had only just started, and in this way she earned the nickname of the Maid of Orléans. Currently, the city celebrates its salvation with annual festivals every May. The Maid of Orléans rode with the Dauphin through the streets and was at his side when he was finally crowned King Charles VII of France. But less than two years later, Jeanne was captured in battle, sold to the English, and put on trial for heresy. On May 30th, 1431, Jeanne d'Arc was brought here, to the old market square in Rouen, where she was burned at the stake. If you liked learning about the history of the Siege of Orléans, support the channel by subscribing and liking. I'll read you below in the comments, and I hope to see you next week.